Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. We can't wait for today's conversation because our guest is going to share why comprehension is not a skill. We know that comprehension is really complicated and often misunderstood because of the way we've sometimes approached it in the past, right? As a set of skills to practice or master in isolation, such as finding the main idea, making inferences, or drawing conclusions. We have an excellent guest today. Robert Pondicio is our guest who's here with us, and he is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on K-12 education, curriculum, teaching, school choice, and charter schooling. Oh, mouthful. <laughs> and like you said, we'll be talking all about reading comprehension, and I would say also its role in the science of reading, which we're always talking yeah. about. So welcome to the podcast, Robert. How are you? I'm well. I always kind of smirk when I hear my job title, which really is my title, Senior <laughs> Fellow. So that, that, it, it, it literally means old man. So yes, I, that, yeah. I'm, I'm an old man. A very important old man. <laughs> <laughs> you're nice. <laughs> Oh, well, we are glad you're here regardless of your age, and we'd love to start by <laughs> thinking about the reading science movement. We would love to know what you appreciate about the reading science movement. Hmm. What, what, what's not to appreciate? My goodness. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've, I've been kind of making curriculum and instruction my, my day job since leaving full-time classroom teaching, goodness, 15 years ago now. Um, I mean, I won't bore you with the details, but, you know, the ed reform movement was kind of like at its most muscular, probably in the first 10 years of this decade. And, and you know, everything that we were doing in, in ed reform was about structures, right? It's about charter schools and testing and standards and accountability. And, and then as now, I was the guy who's like, can we talk about what the kids are doing all day? Because that, that, that seems better. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I was just kind of struck then and now as to how relatively incurious we have been you know, as, as ed reformers about curriculum, about, we didn't call it the science of reading, but about literacy instruction, about curriculum and whatnot. So um, if you had told me, you know, as recently as five years ago that we'd be having this um, you know, science of reading movement, I'd have thought, well, that would be lovely, but maybe not in my <laughs> lifetime. So um, here it is, you know, so um, I, I'm, I'm not one of those who's gonna criticize this. I mean, you know, we can have a more nuanced v vision of what should be part of the science of literacy, um, but goodness, it's, it's exciting. And I, I'll go as far as saying, for the first time in, in my, you know, out of classroom career, I'm actually guardedly optimistic that it could make a difference. We are too. <laughs> yes. I mean, I I, can, can, like... can, let, let me qualify that, by the way, what I, what I say when yeah, I mean yeah. that. Why, why am I optimistic? Because, frankly, I've been a little bit of a skeptic over the years that you can change practice through, you know, distant action. In other words, you know, you can't legislate your way into good instruction and curriculum. I mean, re remember that under No Child Left Behind, we passed a law that said every child would be re reading on grade mm -hmm. level by 2014. You know, that's, that's how these things tend to go. Um, but I mean, there is a seriousness about this, and I think it's coming from within the field. It's not just coming from from lawmakers and state houses and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's why I'm optimistic. In other words, the conditions the the the, the 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 conditions are lining up that I think we're we're really starting to see some some you know some real good um, movement on on what good literacy instruction looks like from both you know public policy and from from within our field. Yeah, well, that's such a good point about like coming from within the field. I think more people are more likely to change that way. You know, like I, I would have more of a feeling of want to change if if it's the educators around me that are are driving that change, not just. Oh. That's, you know. that's, 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 it's <laughs> really important. <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, Rick Hess, my boss at AEI says this all the time. He said, it's really easy to get thing, people to do things. It's really hard to get them to do it well. Um, so that's, yeah. that's the difference. In other words, if teachers yeah. change their practice, I mean, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about Emily Hanford and her work, but I mean, the, the, the real kind of hammer through glass that she's achieved in her work is is painting a picture and by the way this is not what we've done in ed reform traditionally but she paints a picture quite vividly of teachers as not sinners but those who've been sinned against i mean how many of us mm -hmm. have you know seen those letters the teachers write i've written them myself like why why didn't i learn this in ed school 
Um, you know, yeah. why was I not prepared uh, to, to, to teach reading the right way? How did I go through, you know, yeah. four years of undergraduate education, two years of graduate school, and never learn how to teach reading effectively? I mean, that's, that, that's a very, it sounds like a small thing, but it's a huge thing when, when, huge. when between, <laughs> say, between holding teachers accountable, oh, you know what to do. We're just going to hold you accountable for doing it and recognizing that as a field, we've just been holding on to some really, you know, forgive me, dumbass ideas about reading. <laughs> yeah. It's almost incomprehensible when you think about it that way. <laughs> It is right. Yeah. I mean, and and for years, um, you know, those of us who've kind of labored at this for a long time, um, I'm sure you've had this experience, like I have. Like, well, wait a minute, don't you, you? You never learned how to teach kids how to read? Like, you know, isn't that kind of like the know, most important crazy. thing that you do? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've told this story a dozen times. You know, it, I was I was a mid career teacher. I started teaching um, when I was 39 years old in in New York City's South Bronx. And I was part of an alternative certification program called the New York City Teaching Fellows. And when I was seeking a placement, um, the, the school that I, I, I went to, they asked me, what grade do you want to teach? And I said, fifth. And, and the, the principal kind of gave me this look like, come on, nobody wants to teach fifth grade. What, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and I was thinking, I don't know how to teach kids how to read. Like, and I'll be found out if you put me in K one right. or two. So give me the older kids. Um, then, then you know, you learn later on. Wait a minute, nobody learns how to teach reading effectively, which is just kind of you know a tragedy and a sin. Absolutely. So I think we're going to jump in a little bit to you mentioned the nuances in what should be included in the science of reading and. Um, and you mentioned Emily Hanford, and I think Solda's story sometimes gets criticized for only focusing in on one part of um, teaching students how to read. So do you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about what are people not talking about with the science of reading and why yeah, that is? I, sure. I, th I mean, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend that I've read all the criticisms, but I've seen some of it on social media. Um, and, and frankly, from folks who I would consider kind of, um, you know, my allies in amen corner, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a little bit d distressing because they're, what, they're, what they're criticizing um, Emily on in the science of reading movement more broadly is, is paying insufficient attention to background knowledge. In other words, oh, this is just about decoding. Fair enough. Um, you know, and I've talked about this for years and years, and you know, I'm an unapologetic disciple of E.D. Hirsch Jr., you know, the, of core knowledge fame. His, his work is my work, basically. Um, but I mean, it's, it, if you don't get kids to the decoding starting line, the game is over. You know? So um, on the one hand, yeah, uh, we need to have a broader view of reading. You know, not, not, in other words, I, I've written about this. Not, we, we need not just a science of reading movement, but a science of reading comprehension movement. Um, but the last thing I'm going to do is, is criticize you know, Emily Hanford and, and science of reading for, for insufficient attention uh, to you know, my personal issue in, in this work, background knowledge and vocabulary. Uh, because again, you know, if, if we don't get kids effectively decoding, um, you know, by the end of say second grade, the, the, the chances that they're going to become proficient readers is, you know, there, there's two chances, slim and none. So let's, you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's not criticize this work for what it's not. Let's take advantage of the fact that for the first time, there's a seriousness um, about, you know, scientifically sound reading instruction and let's grow the movement from there. Yeah, I agree. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. You know, and even like thinking about foundational skills in K2, that doesn't mean that we completely negate background knowledge and sure. vocabulary, right? We want to do all of that at once. So to that end, in 2020, you wrote an article titled, Reading Comprehension is Not a Skill. Mm. I'd love to know what you meant by that. It's one of my favorites, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. That's, that's, that's very kind. Um, it's funny. I, I, um, I say this all the time that reading comprehension is not a skill you teach. It's a condition you create. And, and look, I, I'm, all I'm going to do is channel the, 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 the work of E.D. Hirsch Jr., um, who I alluded to earlier. I mean, I, I think I told you this story before we started recording, but when I was teaching in the South Bronx, Hirsch was the one guy whose work described what I saw in my South Bronx classroom, fifth grade classroom, every single day. Kids who could decode, you know, some more fluently than others. Um, but I never had any kids in five years in my school that could, quote, not read. They were all decoders. They, they, they struggled with comprehension. 
And, you know, uh, we were a teacher's college, Lucy Calkins, you know, demonstration school. Mine was a demonstration classroom. And to hear my staff developers describe it, well, the reason that the kids were struggling with comprehension was they were disengaged. The curriculum didn't reflect their, their interests. Um, if we just kind of sold them on reading, um, then, then, then the magic would happen. Um, and, and there's, there's a little bit of wisdom to that, which we can, can unpack in a second, but, but Hirsch by contrast would look at what was happening in my classroom and say, no, it's background knowledge. Um, and, and, and he's right about that. In other words, and, and you know, we, we needn't go over, I'm sure our listeners are familiar with the, the, the famous Recton Leslie baseball study, but we know that when kids are reading about a subject, they know, well, they appear to be far better comprehenders than, quote, skilled readers who lack the background knowledge. Um, so it was no surprise, or it shouldn't have been a surprise, when kids in my school, you know, a very low-income school in the South Bronx, when they appeared to be proficient readers and writers about subjects they knew well, but then it's, what happens? The test comes along, and suddenly it's as if their brains have fallen out of their head, right? Like they've forgotten everything. Right. <laughs> Um, and I'll never forget this, like a, a year or so after I was had left the classroom, I I'm driving around somewhere um, and there was an NPR story um, about reading and, and so I'm half paying attention and suddenly I, I hear my, my ex-principal's voice um, and she was <laughs> describing how, well, it's, you know, it's test anxiety. And I literally started screaming at the radio, like, no, <laughs> it's background knowledge. It's background oh, knowledge. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, it, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. And what, what yeah. she was saying in her empathetic way was, you know, it's really distressing because we see the kids doing wonderful work. But then, you know, it's as if they, they've forgotten everything when the test comes. No, it's because the test questions are not about their lives and their interests. Um Hirsch's work explains that Lucy Calkins and others' work does not. It's it, I, I, at the risk of oversimplifying it. Well, okay, I, I really think it's just about that simple. Yeah, I love the. Um, I think this quote came from that article. Correct me if I'm wrong, either one of you, but you said they weren't missing what good readers do; they were missing what good readers know. Yeah, no, that's exactly I right. That. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, this is it's it's look. I, I don't want to oversell this. It is it is very very difficult to um, you know prepare kids who come from you know knowledge poor backgrounds, as it were, um, to to right. make them to, to 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 give them what those good readers have the rich you know uh, source of background knowledge and vocabulary. If you're an affluent kid, I mean you know. Put yourself in the shoes of a of a you know a kid on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which was three subway stops away from where I was teaching. You know, you're you're living in one of the most affluent zip codes in America. Your out of school hours are filled with with enrichment. You know, summer travel, ballet lessons, sports, etc. You you probably live in a two parent home with parents who went to college, who speak in full sentences, who engage you in rich dinner table conversation. You know, you're growing up in a language and knowledge rich stew. The, the, the kids that I taught in the South Bronx had none of those advantages. So let, let's not kid ourselves that it's, it's easy, it's a simple matter of curriculum to close those gaps. But my point is, unless we at least acknowledge that the, the source of those gaps is, is knowledge and vocabulary, then we're making no attempt to, you know, to address it whatsoever. So that, that was my point in, you know, it's, it's not a skill that you teach, it's a condition that you create. Um, and yeah, I mean, good good readers come to us, uh, or or uh, well off kids come to class with just so much more um, walking around, taken for granted knowledge and vocabulary um, that then 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 we have the ability to address sometimes. You know, so we at least have to recognize you know language proficiency for what it is and what it's not. Yeah, I, I have a four-year-old and um, I currently write curriculum for fifth grade. And so often I'm reading him books at night where it actually connects to like what's going to be in that fifth grade curriculum. And I think like, look at this, like I'm already giving him like seeds of yeah. there's like different layers of the earth, right? And like, he doesn't totally get it at four years old, but you know, it, it won't be completely unfamiliar to him when he sees it again in school. Oh, yeah, I've heard this before, you know, yeah. and, and I just I'm constantly thinking about that. Like, you're right, you know, kids that aren't getting that same experience at home when they're young and they're, it's going to be a foreign concept to them. And how different will that be when they get to school? Yep. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's and and that, and, that uh, content vocabulary that you're building. 
Oh, mm-hmm. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just say that, that that that's exactly right, and and this is why I want to be modest in our expectations, and and I'm an unrepentant curriculum guy, um, but the, these issues transcend mere curriculum. I mean, what I what I often counsel schools and teachers, uh, I think I wrote about this in my book um, about Success Academy in New York City is is you know, um, and it's, and by the way, this is exactly the opposite of the the, the Calkins approach which tends to, you know, always uh, want to ref- uh, reflect children's interest and experience. What I, what I term the mirror, you know, mm-hmm. Hirsch by contrast is focusing kids' attention out the window. Um, and I think that's broadly, you know, th- that, that's the way to think about this. At least that, that's how I find it helpful to think about this. You know, for our students, are we directing their attention into the mirror or out the window? Because let's be honest, there is, you know, as, as we're discussing, you know, 180 days times seven hours times 13 years is still not enough time to, to you know, account for all of the taken for granted uh, knowledge and vocabulary that educated people assume or have and assume that their listeners and readers have as well. So you almost have to rely on that orientation. You know, again, be modest. You're not going to have time to, who, who would have thought that we would have been, you know, ever taught, you know, um, word like, COVID, social distancing, masking, <laughs> you know, th- these are, these are not in any <laughs> curriculum, you know, now they're understood terms and, and language works this way all the time. You know, terms come into and out of use constantly. So the only way that you can kind of uh, cultivate or, or the only way you can account for that is by cultivating a, a, a curiosity about the world in our students. Yeah. Can you actually say more about that? I know we didn't prep for this. So if you don't want to, you don't have to, but like, Say that workshop model is in play yeah. and I, I'm a, a student who has all of these books to choose from, right? Like that's the idea behind it. So I'm going to turn, I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to pick from all of these books. Can you share how that would not be the windows approach, how that's more of the mirrors well, approach? Well, let, let, let me, before I do that, um, Lori, if I can, can I, can I steel man yeah. that, you know, um, let, let me tell you why I think it, it, it can be effective. I mean, not, not wholly effective, but while it, why it's not, not, not entirely terrible. I mean, we, we know that, yeah. that, um, that, that just tonnage matters, right? In other words, the more kids read, um, the, the more they're going to, you know, uh, vocabulary, for example, they're going to take in. I mean, don't quote me on on these exact numbers, but there was a terrific paper written some years ago uh, by Keith Stanovich and Ann Cunningham, and it broke down in a table, like the number of rare and unique words per thousand in different kinds of texts. And from memory, I think even kids' books have more sophisticated language than the, the conversation of college graduates. So it's not as if it's a waste to just have kids reading just for the sake of reading. Okay, so let's, you know, I, I, let, let's give the devil the, the devil is due <laughs> and acknowledge that there is some value into just reading and just getting kids engaged by reading. Okay, fine. That said, it's kind of like going to the gym and working out your arms because, well, I like, I hate leg day. I'm, I'm just going to do my arms. <laughs> you know, you're not going to end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, or Popeye with like just big arms and everything else scrawny. You have <laughs> right. to kind of right. like attend to to your, your general fitness. So, um, you know, and this, by the way, is I think why some of these pedagogies have gained so much traction over the years, because look, it makes us feel good as teachers, right? Oh, look, they're reading. The kids are really engaged. They're loving their books. I'm, I'm encouraging a lifelong love of reading. Yay me. I'm good at what I do. Um, you know, right, there's, there's some choice, right? There's that. choice in the matter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you're doing your kids a disservice um, by by not attending to that development of of, of of a broad knowledge of the world, curiosity about the world. Um, it's not as hard. That is not, it's not that hard to get kids to be interested in what they're al- already interested in. You know, um, you know, this is why people defend Captain Underpants, you know, and whatnot. Because look, <laughs> as long as they're reading. You know, there's there, again, there's some wisdom to that, but but we're selling kids short, um, and they're not, and and then we then they're not going to be proficient readers. To go back to what we're saying before, they don't know what good readers know if all they're reading is is the stuff they already know. Right. Sure. What I think about that too is, you know, as a teacher, you only have so much time for your reading yeah. block and your writing, your, for your reading and writing time. So right. So maybe it's 120 minutes a day if you're in K two. Maybe it's. I assume it's probably less if you're in three, five. I remember when I taught fifth grade, it was, you know, 60 minutes. And um, I just keep thinking, 
if we're trying to maximize the use of instructional time is spending 20 of them the best with kids, like quote, just reading, right? Like just Mm -hmm. independent reading or whatever it might be that it would make more sense to be steering them toward that knowledge rich approach toward the vocabulary rich approach. Yeah, I, I don't have these figures in front of me, but I know that the, the amount of time that kids spend um, per day on average in science and social studies is appallingly low, you know, and it is because we are overly fetishizing the so-called, you know, skills and strategies approach. You know, I, I think the more sophisticated you become about these things, the more you're likely to bump up the amount of science and reading Oh, sorry, science and social studies and art and music and just the, the whole full rich curriculum that, that Hirsch and others have written about over the years. I, I alluded to a book that I wrote a few years ago about Success Academy in New York City, which is a super successful chain of charter schools, unusually successful. Um, and as I, I think I said in that book that even though they are not core knowledge schools, E.D. Hirsch would feel comfortable there because he would see the kids, you know, he would see them focusing their attention, metaphorically speaking, out the window, getting art and music, you know, and science every day, um, you know, and not, you know, endlessly gazing into their navels, um, you know, uh, about, about, you know, their, their, their own experience. So, you know, there, there's, I, I think that's part of the, there's more reasons why they're effective, but that, that's, I think they've, they've nailed that part and, and good for them. Yeah. So would you say some of the drawbacks of like not teaching using a knowledge building approach? I mean, I'll just give a couple and then I'd love for you Mm -hmm. to to add more or react to, um, for example, that it becomes a comprehension strategy instruction. It becomes, uh, like maybe a leveled reading approach. Like there are Mm -hmm. other approaches that happen when knowledge building isn't at the forefront. Could you say, say, react to what I said and maybe say more? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that was basically the way I was taught to teach reading and probably most of us were, right? In other words, uh, oh, you're yeah. teaching, <laughs> you're, you're, you're reducing reading comprehension to a suite of skills and strategies, you know? Um, and, and look, I'm going to do it again, um, and I'm going to be fair and say, well, that's not entirely wrong. There's good evidence to suggest that sure. some strategies instruction <laughs> does work, Um my my sense of it, um, at least what I what I think I've learned from Dan Willingham, the the University of Virginia cognitive scientist, who if you haven't had on this podcast, you you should. He's you know he's terrific. We just had him on, yeah. Oh, there you we go. Okay, on. well then he'll he'll correct me if I've got this wrong. But but um, <laughs> my, my my sense from Dan's work is that you know the 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 use of skills and, or strategies is that it reminds readers that you know there, there there's a reason you're reading. You're supposed to be taking some meaning from this. And it's a reminder to kind of like you know check for check yourself for for, for understanding, but but I, I believe there's not any evidence that sh- that you can gain much once you have that kind of you know basic understanding that there's not a lot to be gained by by practicing them you know uh, it, it like in, in other words what skills and strategies seem to do like if you we're we're, we're, we're um, on a podcast right now and but we're on um, a Zoom like um, platform where we can see each other so if I say something. That that confuses you. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna see that you're not comprehending. You may shoot me a look or whatnot. Well, you can't do that when you're reading. Um, so you know the skills and strategies is kind of a substitute for that. It's a it, it's to remind yourself. Huh? Wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. Go back and reread. Ask yourself some of these metacognitive questions in an attempt to um, uh, you know make up for that lack of comprehension. But but what they are not is you know an all purpose suite of skills and strategies that you can apply in the absence of background knowledge and the absence of vocabulary, you know like like a formula that you can apply that will help you make sense of of, of any text you know regardless of your familiarity with with the, the the schema as as it were. That that's I think where we fall down is where we conceive of reading comprehension as not just a skill, but a transferable skill, like throwing a ball or riding a bike. Hey, once I learn how to ride a bike, I can ride any bike. And once I learn how to read, I can read anything, right? Well, it's mm-hmm. not, not exactly, doesn't exactly work that way. Yeah, I was going to bring up, there was quite, quite a debate on <laughs> social media the last week or so about just this. And I mm-hmm. thought, I think, I just always thought it was really interesting because, um, I don't think anyone is saying, and we're all knowledge building advocates here, but I don't think anyone is saying that we would not teach kids those reading strategies and give them those, I mean, they are research-based skills and strategies that mm-hmm. 
we know will help kids become better readers. I don't think anyone's advocating for just like blindly giving kids like texts that we think are going to help build their knowledge. And then that's all, that's it. That's the end of the yeah. story. Um, I don't know. Do you have any reaction to that? Because no, no, I, I think I, I, you know, we are in violent agreement. Um, it's, it's not as if they, <laughs> that they are, they, they have no use whatsoever, but we, we worship excessively at the altar of skills and strategies and assume that yeah. they are transferable when they are not. So it's, it's less a question of good versus bad. It's a question of, you know, balancing the scale, you know, and, and, and opportunity yeah. cost, right? In other words, Every hour that you are spending exclusively focused on skills and strategies is an hour you're not building background knowledge, that you're not doing potentially right. more enriching things with kids than, um, right. you know, than, than um, practicing finding the main idea, questioning the author, making a text to world connection, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And I know, I mean, I am guilty of this, so I, I'll say it, is I was guilty of just teaching those kind of in isolation and in the text yeah didn't really matter. You know, it yeah. was like, okay, this week I need to teach them how to ask good questions, find something yeah. that I, <laughs> I'm going to teach that with. <laughs> and hold on, Melissa, let's, let, let's be clear here. You're not, you were not guilty of that. It's not like you woke <laughs> up one morning and decided that this was what you wanted <laughs> to, do. The way to do. This it. is what we <laughs> right. were taught was best practice, right? Right. This is what you do because why? Because, and those curriculum because... materials reinforced it. Yeah. Right. Well, so look, we were taught it in college. Yeah, if you want to go I, even further, I don't further, know my curriculum materials. To, yeah, <laughs> sure, of course, of course. No, this was best practices. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've I've described my kind of my own journey through through this as a teacher. This is where it kind of benefited me by being a mid career switcher. You know, I was I was you know a few months away from forty when I started teaching, so th therefore it'd probably been thirty years since I'd set foot in an, in an elementary school, like since I'd been an elementary school <laughs> student. And I remember thinking. You know, I don't remember doing any of this when I was a kid, um, and but but you know, but but maybe they know something. And then, of course, I realized that less than one out of five kids in my school was reading on grade level. So then your skepticism goes to you know, or, or your w willing suspension of disbelief turns into skepticism. Uh, that it kind of turns into militants and anger and crusading, um, but um, but you know, no, no, the, the the real bad guy here. Um, Maybe testing at the end. Look, I'm not anti-testing whatsoever. Oh, yeah. no, nobody should should sentimentalize the day before we had standardized testing and assume that all was well. It was not. I mean, testing really surfaced some of these issues. Um, but if we're being brutally honest, testing uh, in, uh, encourages you know the, the skills and strategies approach because you can't know what the reading passages are going to be on a test. So it almost encourages, I, I shouldn't say almost, it literally encourages bad practice. It encourages teachers mm -hmm. to try to protect against that um, you know, those unknown passages by teaching skills and strategies. I, I've, I've banged on about this for years. Um, and so has E.D. Hirsch, um, you know, that if we really understood reading for what it is, then we would control for background knowledge and reading tests. We, you know, we, we like, by the way, you know, there's no mystery what's going to be on a, a fourth or fifth grade math test, right? It's not like we're keeping right. a secret from teachers. Hey, it's going to be basic functions. It's going to be, you know, percents, decimals, and ratios. It's not And you cheating. can change the numbers there yeah, and it not, <laughs> does it's, translate. It's, yeah, it's not cheating totally. to know what's going to be on, you know, the math test. Um, they're, they're not going to throw trigonometry at, at fourth graders just as a gotcha. Um, so why wouldn't you <laughs> want to tell teachers what the, 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 the domain knowledge will be on, on a reading test? Hey, um, yeah. you know, okay, this is, don't ever put me in charge of education in America, but if you do, this is, this is what I'm going to do, folks. I'm going to say, okay, in fourth grade, in this test, uh, in this state, um, the, 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 the domains that you need to cover, or the, the domains are going to be on the test. I'm not even going to see, say you need to cover them, but in fourth grade, the, the reading passage domains are going to come from say, you know, photosynthesis, the water cycle, the Vikings, ancient Egypt, Rome, and 20 other topics. Um, so that's, you know, we're not going to tell you which of those, but we're going to tell you, those are going to be the domains, you know, from which the reading passages on this year's reading test will be culled. Well, then you can bet your bottom dollar that teachers will start teaching those subjects, right? Because then, right. then it's like it, it makes a reading test something like a math test. You can prepare for it. That would be the way to get past skills and strategies, honestly, is by having um, you know, domain specific reading tests. Um, it would control for background knowledge and it would make tests uh, more useful because it would create an incentive, in my mind, to actually teach domains of knowledge as opposed to skills and strategies.
that's my TED talk. That's Thanks a good for point. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like it because it connects that connector idea of, you know, there are skills in math, but I think the skills that we interpret in ELA are misguided, right? Because we do need those skills and strategies. We just need them in the background to access the knowledge. So I, I'm wondering like what you would say or respond, how you would respond to people who say there's no evidence to support knowledge building ELA curriculum, or that it doesn't have any research to show improvements in, in ELA and student comprehension. Yeah, there's a great Tim Shanahan piece about this. I think just the other day, or maybe it was there one sure that he is, just kind yeah. of he uh, he maybe he trotted it out. I and mean, he, you know, Tim is brilliant, and and he he often <laughs> just kind of republishes stuff. Um, not not because he's lazy, but because these these questions keep coming up. So I don't know if, if this was a new piece or not, uh, or whether one from his his prodigious greatest hits album. Um, <laughs> but I I, I, I think. Um, there's a difference between understanding that good readers have a lot of background knowledge and figuring out how to pack that into a curriculum. Um, I mean, Tim can speak for himself, but it, I don't think it should surprise anybody that it's difficult to prove a cause and effect relationship between, you know, pulling the, the, the curriculum lever here and seeing it on a test result. And I think it has to do with the unpredictability of, of these, of, of, of the domains of knowledge on a reading test. Uh, but my guess is that if you were able to create a test that controlled for background knowledge, that you would see an effect. So let's say, for example, um, I mean, I'm a you know I'm a I'm a core knowledge guy, so it would be easy to do with core knowledge. So you know, if it's, let let's say, for example, you were able to create an adaptive exam um, where the reading passages uh, reflected that given year's. Um, uh, core knowledge sequence, the topics in the sequence. Well, then I'm, I would bet every dime that I had that you would see a direct result between uh, a curriculum um, input and a reading test output, but it has to be the same domain. O over time, uh, I believe, and I think this was Tim's point in his column as well, you would see you would see effect over time because if you think about it, you know, you're constantly building knowledge um, but you don't know what the since you don't know what the the the, the test passage is going to be about. You don't know whether the domain that you learned in third grade is going to come up with a third grade test, or the eleventh grade test, or never. Right. Um, so un right. unless you align the test with the curriculum, it shouldn't surprise us. I think that you don't see uh, a measurable effect. You'd only see a measurable effect if, in fact, that's exactly what you did. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, and we haven't done that yet. No, so that's why. Yeah. Um, well, no, I, I mean, I, you know, I just nattered on about the need for domain specific reading tests. Um, I don't know where this work stands, but a few years ago under John White in Louisiana, the, the, the former state ed chief down there, they, they were planning to do exactly that. They were planning to, to, I think it was in the middle school level for memory. They, they were mm -hmm. planning on, on, um, making a domain specific reading tests in middle school. My, my only criticism would be why middle school, why not start, you know, in third grade and why not do it in, in every grade. Um, and again, I don't know where that work stands right now, whether or not they actually went through with that or not. Um, but it'd be, it'd be interesting. They did. They did. Okay. <laughs> they did. Yeah. We, we talked to a team from Louisiana in September of last year, um, and they're working on it and growing it. So they, they're, and they're seeing positive results. There you go. There you go. So I have a controversial question for you. Now. Uh oh, <laughs> I, 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 I never get those, Melissa. You know, <laughs> so we hear this question a lot when we talk about knowledge building, which mm. is, well, what, what, what knowledge yeah, who's, who's to knowledge? say, yeah, yeah. right. Who's to say what, what the knowledge is and, you know, is there a way to include content when it gets so controversial and political? Yeah. Well, I, it, it, my, my favorite story about this is some years ago, um, do you remember Michelle Ree, who was, you know, the, the, um, yeah. the, 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 the head of education in Washington, DC, and she was like a national figure. She was on the mm -hmm. cover of time magazine, holding a broom, you know, to signify her you know desire to, to, to sweep away bad teachers on and on and on. So at one point while I was still in the classroom, uh, I got invited to a, a talk that she was giving at the Manhattan Institute in New York city. And she gave this kind of 
you know, blood and guts, bare knuckle, don't be afraid of confrontation, you know, <laughs> fight, fight, fight speech that she was kind of renowned for. And then I raised my hand to ask a question and say, well, okay, you know, misery, what about curriculum? And she just kind of almost laughed. You know, she just got a chuckle and said, the last thing I'm going to do is take on a curriculum fight. So, so here's this person who's like, <laughs> you know, the poster child for, for, you know, get into the arena and get yourself bloody. And she doesn't want to touch <laughs> curriculum. But so not maybe, that. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. But, 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 not, but that's a third rail. That, that I'm afraid of. So, you know, I, 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 I say this because it is not a surprise that, that even the fiercest among us um, shrink from this fight. Um, because it is deeply personal. Um, there's cultural baggage, there's racial baggage, you know, it, it, it touches yeah. not just the third rail, but all of the third rails. Um, look, you know, my, my answer to this, it hasn't changed in, in, in 20 years. And again, I'm going to, you know, invoke E.D. Hirsch. Um, you know, Hirsch, when he first came out with his book, Cultural Literacy, in I think 1987, was maligned. Um, as wanting to impose a dead white male canon on American education. And I just think that's that's unfair and inaccurate. In other words, you know, this was not Hirsch coming down from, you know, the mountain with stone tablets and saying, you know, thou shalt learn these things because I said so. You know, his, if I can, you know, uh, summarize a, a lifetime of his work into a sentence or two, <laughs> it's basically like, look, you know, literate people Literate writers and speakers make assumptions about what their their audiences, their their listeners, and their readers know. And when those assumptions are correct, um, when we're all operating on the same you know base of background knowledge, then 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 language actually feels like a skill. There's a reason we think that reading comprehension is a skill because it feels like one to us, right? We we are we are swimming in like 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 the proverbial fish that doesn't know what's in water. We don't know that we're swimming in assumed knowledge. So right. when, when um, speakers and listeners, when readers and writers are on the same metaphorical page, la language is, is a fluid, almost effortless thing. So um, I, I say that because to, to, to accuse Hirsch and others of wanting to impose a canon, the whose knowledge question, misunderstands the way language works. Um, I mean, I don't want to be rude about it, but, but language doesn't care what you think. In other words, um, you know, there's, it is not, we, we can't control this, but, but so to, to me, the key to understanding Hirsch's work is not to view it as canon making, but as a curatorial effort. Look, here's what literate people know and assume you know too. And, and once we know that's how, how language works, um, then that puts the onus on us as teachers to ensure that kids, especially disadvantaged kids, have access to the knowledge and vocabulary you know, that they too can swim in this water without knowing they're swimming in this water. Um, so I, I don't know a way around that. You know, in other words, I can't change how language works. I can teach it. Um, I can prepare you for it, but I cannot, I can't change that. So, you know, at the risk of oversimplifying, I think it leaves us with a choice. Whenever we have these conversations about whose knowledge, there, there, you, you have to come down one side of this question or the other. You can either prepare the child for the world, or you can change the world for the child. Those are both hard to do. One's a lot harder. Yeah. A lot harder. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's, in other words, when, when, when you want to have that whose knowledge question, well, then you're saying, no, I'm going to change the world or, or the world should change for this child. Okay. That's right. lovely, but it's not going to happen. Yeah. And, and and sorry, yeah. you, now you've you've wound me up, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go on a bit. About That's okay. This. We have another but, question too that might wind, okay. wind you up more. But, so keep going. All right. So, so okay. Let's, let let let's assume because I, I I'm not a teacher basher. I, I don't think any any of us wake up in the morning determined to do to do anything other than our best for kids, right? So you may be the most empathetic teacher that you want this child's education to honor their 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 home language and culture and their interests and on and on and on. Um, one day those kids are going to leave us, okay? And they're going to out into a world that might not be as prepared to, to, to judge them warmly as we are. Um, my friend Mark Bauerlein some years ago wrote a piece for, um, I think it was in the Chronicle of Higher Education, where he envisioned the scenario where a kid, you know, good grades in school, um, you know, black kid in, in his scenario, um, is interviewing for a job at a law school or at, at, at a law firm 
And um, I can't remember the specific um, reference that Mark put in his piece, but let's say it was like a, a, an allusion to a, to Greek myths. You know, one of the one of the persons interviewing it makes an allusion to Pandora's box or Achilles' heel, and the kid says, "I'm sorry, what's that?" Um, and and the person doing the interview makes an assumption about that kid, like, "Huh, I can't believe he didn't know that. Maybe he's not as smart as I think." Um, so this is my point. You know, the, the world is prepared to judge our students a, a lot less generously than we are. So if you think you're doing kids a favor um, by, by decolonizing the curriculum, whatever you want to call it, just know that there could be a price for that at some day. So I, I, I've never wanted to, to say, look, teach this, not that. But I want all of us in this work to really understand viscerally that these are high stakes decisions. You know, and 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 what we think we're yeah. the decisions we think we're making today, out of empathy, um, to 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 you know, not, and and to be you know, um, you know empathetic and and you know committed educators, well th those those decisions might not um, they they might have effects in the real world that we're not accounting for. Um, you know, I, and I don't know how to change that. I mean, I've I've said for years that that um, you know, if, when I when I really want to get myself canceled. I'll write a piece called language doesn't give an F what you think. Okay. And it would be about exactly this about how we cannot like that language proficiency is like a, a you know, a river like that, that cannot be kept within its banks. You know, we have to, we can't control it, but we can, we can, and, and look, it changes over time. Right. I made this point for years. Like my grandparents mm -hmm. said things like 23 skidoo that, that we don't say anymore, right? <laughs> you know, um, so, so it, American English is this kind of vernacular engine that is constantly borrowing idioms and whatnot from other cultures. Um, that, that happens all the time, but we think as teachers that we can control it and we can't. Yeah, that's such a good point. There's a constant like inflow and outflow too, right? Like the little, the, I don't even know what you just said. I don't, I've never heard that yeah. before. I told you, <laughs> but, you know, then I'm I an old my, man. <laughs> I, I, no, but then I hear my fifth grader and she like says things like sus. I'm like, can you, can you explain that to me? What does yeah. that mean? <laughs> you know? and, and I mean, um, you know, it, we, we also, sorry, a, a brief diversion. We kind of, you know, mock these yeah. when, when kids use slang and whatnot, but sometimes slang, you know, insinuates itself into the language. We use the word, the word friend as a verb. You know, like we friend somebody on social media, you know, so, so, um, you know, it changes slowly. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we kids say bounce or peace out, you know, whatnot, you know, th those words will, will stick. Some of them will not, not today's slang becomes tomorrow's usage. Hmm. Okay. So I have one more controversial question. Uh -oh. Um, <laughs> so we know that like school districts and, and school boards are often faced with objections from like just a handful of parents mm -hmm. about this knowledge stuff. I'm wondering if you have any advice to share their listening or, Ooh. um, I know I often speak and about usually reading and about writing. The, like what knowledge it is, right? Correct. It's about the what knowledge. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's a hard one. So and, not, so not, um, not knowledge or not. The what, yeah, not knowledge yeah. or not, right? Yeah, we know that that's topics. solid, but yeah. Well, look, th th this is not quite the question you're asking, but let me try coming at it from this angle. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of um, legislation in various states the last couple of years aimed at curriculum transparency, right? And this idea that, and, and, and I, I don't think it's a bad idea. In fact, I think it's a good idea. And um, we, we forget often that the vast majority of us who teach for a living, we are government employees. We're public servants, right? We are, we are not free agents. Uh, we're not private practitioners. We are doing the people's business, period, full stop. You know, we, we are, you know, we have tremendous amounts of influence over captive audiences of other people's children. Um, you know, these classrooms are not performance spaces for us. You know, we have an obligation to be kind of, you know, sober, humble people. Um, and I'm going to die on that hill. You know, that, 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 that we, we have to remember that we're, we're, we're public employees. So curriculum transparency is kind of a piece with that. There should not be a lot of mystery about what happens in, in a public school classroom. You know, it shouldn't be secretive. Um, so, but what my, my concern about that is, is a lot of people think, well, if I know the curriculum, then I know what my child is learning all day. And you know, as well as I do, that's not true. I mean, the vast majority of us, uh, customized lessons. We differentiate. We look for stuff on the internet to, you know, engage our kids. 
you know, some curriculum, just because a curriculum is adopted doesn't mean that it's taught uh, either in whole or, or at all. It could just sit on the shelf. Um, so this, this, you know, once you kind of understand that, then you start to realize there's a whole lot we don't know about what happens in this, the, the typical American classroom. And it's really hard to, to suss it out. Um, I mean, one of the reasons we're having kind of a crisis of trust right now in American education is because of Zoom school, right? So for years, we just kind of sent our kids off and we just assumed that, you know, uh, you know, it's all the same. You know, every kid is learning. Oh, I've got the, I, I went to curriculum night, so I know what they're learning, whatever. Suddenly when, when it's, it's coming onto your kitchen table, you know, it changes your view of it. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, right? Um, so that's what's driving yeah. a lot of anxieties about um, what kids are learning all day is for a couple of years, um, parents have had a literal front row seat, you know, um, an electronic front yeah. row seat. Uh, and, and, it, and some parents were quite upset about that. Um, so on the one hand, this shouldn't surprise us, but we can't unring this bell. I mean, we're, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're not going to go back to the days of, you know, just, just trust the teacher and assume all will be well. Now that parents know, hey, some of what's going on I might not like, um, we're going to have these fights over and over and over again. Do I know how to resolve them? No, I don't. Um, I mean, look, we have, you know, 14,000 school boards in this country. Um, you know, this is the system we have. You go to your school board, um, you, if, uh, you, you raise your voice, um, you know, or you, in, in praise or condemnation and, and you make yourself heard. Um, you know, look, in, in a perfect world, I think there would be a lot more transparency and you know, teachers will hate when I say this, um, but at least in the in the early grades, um, there should pr probably be a lot less um, curriculum choice. Uh, you know, there there, it, there should probably be less mystery. Uh, again, I'm I'm speaking as an elementary educator. There should probably be a lot more regularity from you know, say K to five, K to six in this country. Um, I've written elsewhere about. Um, you know, how just the, the, the act of having to spend all of our time customizing and choosing curriculum takes time away from more valuable things that we could be doing, like giving feedback, like studying student work, like developing relationships with students and parents. So even if you're developing the best curriculum and the best lesson plans imaginable, someone else can do that. Let's have teachers focus only on, on you know, the stuff that only they, literally, that, that, they, that they can only do. I think that would actually improve outcomes for kids. But it would also solve some of these other problems. There should probably be less of a mystery about what gets taught. Again, at least in elementary school, in middle school, and certainly in high school, then there's a lot more room for individualization, customization. You know, all roads come back to knowledge, ladies. So, I mean, to me, you know, this, this would get us all operating on the same base of, of, of knowledge. It would, build voc it would build vocabulary, it would build language proficiency, it would build, you know, reading comprehension. If we build that foundation well, in the you know the elementary years, then there's a lot more room for innovation and a full flowering of personal interest after that. You know, one man's opinion; others are going to disagree. Um, but but that, and that may not be the way to solve the dilemma that you're you're rightly concerned about. Whose knowledge? But it's a start. Yeah, that's really good. I probably push a little bit that I do think high quality materials have a little more transparency than like. If we're talking about it than like a workshop if, model if they get taught right if they get taught as yeah. yes yeah and i mean just from what i know about wit and wisdom when we used it in baltimore yeah. and what i know about what's happening in my local school di district here you know when i go to the school board meetings and i do raise my voice and advocate i hear that like there are lots of unanswered questions from parents like well what exactly like what books are in the classroom and yeah. you know it's their right to know it's also that this the school I do think they should know that like if they have questions they it should it should be transparent um but I do think it's much more transparent like to be able to say if we're teaching this with fidelity here is yeah. what your child is required to read right and yep. learn I just think that it's clear overall but not to say that that's a perfect solution at all because there's so no, many 
Uh, Look, I, I agree with you. And I don't want to give the impression that I'm anti-choice. In other words, there should be free. Uh, I had free reading time 50 years ago in elementary school. There should always be time for kids to, to, to read books that interest them, you know, go to the library. That was always like the big treat when the scholastic book fairs happened and when you got to go to library day and pick out your, your, your oh, books. Still for... a big deal. Still a big yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was fun. So I, 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 I don't and it should I don't, be, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to present myself as the guy who's like, no, I'm going to assign a kid every book that he or she is ever going to read. That's, that's not my <laughs> point. But look, even if you're a fan of the workshop model, um, I, I know that when I would do my conferences with my students, I had much more rich conversations about books that I was familiar with than, oh, I've got a classroom library of a thousand books, only which a small <laughs> fraction of which I've ever read. And now I'm going to have a skills and strategies discussion about a book that I've never read with a kid. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's not satisfying either. Uh, it's not satisfying for me as a teacher, and I'm sure it wasn't you know, particularly helpful for the student either. So there's something to be said as well for deeper, richer conversations that students and teachers have um, when, they are, when they have shared um, you know, uh, understanding or, or experience of the book. Super good point, yeah. All right, I'm going to bring us back full circle uh -oh. <laughs> to the beginning. We were talking about the science of reading movement. Mm -hmm. And just to sort of wrap us up here at the end, I'm wondering if you could give any advice to, you know, most of our listeners are teachers, but mm -hmm. leaders or people like us. Um, you know, where do we go next with the science of reading movement to include comprehension and knowledge and... <sighs> What, yeah. what do we do? <laughs> um, well, I mean, well, for, for starters, I mean, just on the science of reading movement and on, you know, on, on foundational skills on decoding and whatnot, um, it's interesting because on the one hand, um, as, as you can probably tell, <laughs> I have some pretty well, well-defined beliefs about, you know, good, better, and best in terms of curriculum, um, but I'm not, I'm not willing to impose them. You know, I, I want teachers to understand um, you know, how language proficiency works, you know, the effects of background knowledge on reading comprehension and, and therefore use that understanding to, you know, to be reflective and make good decisions. Um, I say that because there, I, the, 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 the number of things that I would impose upon American education is a lot smaller than it used to be. And it really comes down to foundational skills. So yeah, I probably would impose a um, you know a a a uh, foundational skills curriculum. Um, this is not the kind of thing that teachers should be freelancing on their own. Um, frankly, look, it's not the type of thing that ed, ed schools. We haven't talked about the the effect of schools of education. Mm. It's it is it's worse than a sin. It's a crime that schools of education um, send, uh, new teachers to schools, not knowing, um, uh, you know, how to teach reading and, and, and uh, okay. I, you know, I, I've said earlier, since we're going full circle that I'm more optimistic than I've ever been about, um, reading achievement in the future because we're having this science of reading mo movement. The exception to that is schools of education. I, I'm, look, I'm, I'm just not that excited that, oh, they're, they're, they're that, I, I don't, I don't know what the data is from um, the ends from um, about, about the percentage of, of schools of education that now include the science of reading. Is that a mention or are you valorizing it? You know, right. Right. Um, another change that I suppose I would make uh, on the state level is I would say, look, in this, in this state, I'm in New York, you guys are, are elsewhere. I don't think there would be anything wrong with a state saying in this state, this is the curriculum we use. I don't want to tell you what the curriculum is, but if I were a state, I would say, look, um, Louisiana did something similar to this a few years ago. Um, this is the foundational skills curriculum that we use in this state, and this is the one that the schools will use. Oh, and oh, by the way, ed schools, if you want to continue to certify teachers, you will ensure that they are graduated knowing how to teach this curriculum. Not just, you know, uh, you didn't have a few weeks on the yeah. science of reading. You have been trained right. in this state curriculum. Um, and now I wouldn't do that for right. everything, but would I do it for foundational skills? You betcha I would. And why that's important, right? Why, how that affects kids everywhere, all over the state. Why Goodness that, gracious. like really draw the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, why Equity. We are equity obsessed, right? Yeah. Um, and and I, I say this um, to, to people's annoyance. I don't want to even hear how serious you are about equity unless you tell me how serious you are about literacy. Because if there's no literacy, there's no equity. 
And if we don't get kids to the starting line decoding, then we're not even having that conversation. So, um, you know, we, we disagree about a lot of things in this work, but goodness, I don't see any, any reasonable objection to the idea that if you can't get kids um, decoding fluently by the end of third grade with a, you know, a, a um, well-codified, well-understood, highly, teachers highly trained in use of um, a, a foundational skills curriculum, then we're not going to make any progress in this at all. I just want to say I love that I feel like you you know you're you're kind of known as a you know a knowledge guy and <laughs> comprehension you write about and I just love that like the thing you would do is impose a foundational skills curriculum because I think it just I, I love that because I think it's similar to things Lori and I talk about all the time it's all important it's all really important <laughs> yeah it's like you, you know, know it's, you, you, you got to get kids in the game if they're not in the game then then you're just spinning yes. your wheels yeah yeah Oh my gosh. Well, I'm wondering, is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know as we have come full circle, we're back around to the beginning, <laughs> anything else you want to leave them with as we close out? No, I just want to express my appreciation for what you're doing. Um, we, be, before we started recording, I was, I was saying that, you know, I was kind of late to the podcasting game as a listener <laughs> and now I'm, I'm addicted. And one of the things that gives me great optimism is the fact that there are so many educators, frontline teachers who are doing exactly what you're doing, who are starting podcasts, who are who are not, you know, wallowing in the woe is me, I never learned this in ed school, but are taking the responsibility for for improving practice, for for educating the field, for sharing what you've learned. Um, you know, if if the cavalry is not coming, then then we got to do it ourselves. Um, so you you guys are, are are doing important work and I and I salute you. Thank you. You too. You keep raising those uh tough, tough issues and absolutely keep commenting on them. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. We're grateful. Well, thank you for being here. Let's do it again. It was fun.